Good morning. Well, welcome to the Baker Institute Energy Forum. It is a real pleasure of mine uh, to uh, host this event today. Um, Rob Gardner uh, came to my office uh, a few months ago when the Outlook for Energy was first published. And uh, we went through in great detail uh, what the methodology ExxonMobil had used and some of the ideas that they felt were important ideas. And uh, frankly, our team was just amazed at um, the level of detail. We were, but we were particularly struck um, by the work in the outlook this year on energy efficiency. Um, and we were just dumbfounded uh, with how sensitive uh, the forecasting is to this part of um, the trends uh, in the industry and in, um, in the developing world. And we thought, you know what, uh, a lot of people probably heard the original presentation of the Outlook or maybe saw some news reports on the Outlook because it's a very interesting Outlook this year and got a lot of press. But we felt that we should share with you uh, some of the amazing insights that we saw uh, when we had a more detailed uh, look at the energy efficiency side um, of the, the, the work this year because it was just really interesting bottom-up um, analysis on um, what we might expect going forward in that area. And I feel it's a very ignored area uh, that we uh, don't have uh, a strong enough understanding of what happens in the boom and bust cycles in oil uh, we underestimate, you know, price goes up for a year and then it comes back down and we think that everything goes back to normal um, and then maybe we really seriously underestimate uh, the long-term impacts of uh, sudden shoot and volatility in prices, uh, especially in this area of energy efficiency. Uh, we don't really have a grip on why we have these demand ideas and we have so much trouble forecasting them over the long term. And so we really felt that uh, ExxonMobil had uh, provided this you know, great service uh, to the public and the industry uh, in the work they had done this year. And so that's why we're holding this special meeting. Um, I will tell a personal story about energy efficiency. Uh, I have a, a class that I teach. I'm teaching two classes now, one on energy policy and uh, one on sustainable development. And this year in the sustainable development class, we pick a different theme each year. Um, and so this year we work with the city of Houston um, to learn about their weatherization program uh, in some of the communities where the city has gone out and helped people who are having trouble meeting their electricity bills. And they're going in and improving the weather stripping and the insulation and uh, Energy Star products in their homes. Um, and we're now doing some surveys to see how effective that's been and studying whether or not it's really helped those families. And there's a team of Rice students who are gonna continue to work on this over the summer. It's a great project, but in trying to manage how to get the students a lesson on energy efficiency um, and having to deal with the Rice legal department and the city's legal department and the legal department of the companies that do weatherization construction uh, we were having trouble resolving what we call the issue of the homeowner, right? How we get the homeowner to release us from the risk of having these interesting 22-year-old engineers come and watch, you know, payless energy insulate and weather strip a home and put in LED light bulbs and so forth. And, it, you know, to a non-lawyer, to me, it just seemed like completely ridiculous. Like, what are the chances that some Rice student's gonna get harmed watching them blow insulation into somebody's attic. Um, but anyway, we decided that we could solve the problem of the homeowner uh, by having them come to my house. And so uh, I tell the story because Rob is gonna talk about energy efficiency. And, um, you know, I have a nice house, I live in this neighborhood. I'm thinking that they're gonna come in and say, well, there's really not much wrong with Mrs. Jaffe's house. Um, and they have this blower door experiment they do where they, they 
seal your house up except for this one little hole and then they blow air into your house for like two hours and analyze all the places the air leaks out and the balance of your house and so on and so forth. And, and then they, they check for your safety risk. Do you have any threats of you know, carbon dioxide in your house and all these things? And to tell you the embarrassing part of the story, of course, my daughter is actually taking the class this semester, so that's making it even more embarrassing for her because there's 35 fellow students in her own home. They're going to see her bedroom with the teddy bear, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, and I'm expecting that they're going to tell me how great my house is. And three labs later, and I won't tell you how much money, everywhere they go in my house, there is a problem in my house. I mean, my hot water heater wasn't sealed properly, and so therefore it was a danger to my home. It turned out the floor under my hot water heater was rotten, and therefore my whole house could have blown up, right? I mean, when I tell you the things that these guys found in my house, all I can tell you is all of you need to go out and have your house tested for weatherization. <laughs> so, uh, so it was a really interesting exercise. And uh, I hope that next year when Rob comes back again to present the outlook, uh, that I can tell you whether my energy bill went up or down. Hopefully it's going to go dramatically down to cover the cost of having to do all this weatherization. Um, but anyway, so it's a, just a very ir interesting area of study. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Rob. He is the manager of economics and energy uh, division at, for ExxonMobil's corporate strategic planning department. He's based in Irving. We need to get you guys down here, put you in the office here in Houston. Um, his group is responsible for the outlook. And uh, he has been involved uh, in a variety of places in the company, uh, close to our hearts because of all the work we do on LNG studies. He's been with ExxonMobil Gas and Power Marketing. And uh, again, starting out of my career, one of the first oil companies that ever talked to me as a journalist was Mobil. So I'm always, always happy to hear that someone was, started out at Mobil because uh, we had a great time. Uh, and Rob uh, graduated from Louisiana State University in 78 with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering. Rob, we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> well, now I'm almost uh, terrified to have my house uh, energy proofed and weatherized. I'm not sure if I want to go through that experience. I think we ought to have a case study after Amy's completely done to make sure we want to do that. Um, the outlook that we're going to go over today is the annual energy outlook that ExxonMobil prepares. It's a, um, it's a study across all the uh, sectors and energy supplies. We do it every year as part of our corporate uh, uh, business planning cycle. We've done it for about half a century. Uh, we've used it extensively in the corporation for individual groups planning activities, but we also use it as part of an external uh, advocacy and literacy program where we take it out and talk to people about what our views are of energy demand and supplies. And we've done that for a number of years. When we, when we construct the outlook, we try to take into account all of the various ways energy impacts on people's lives, but we start at a very granular level. We break it down into 100 geographic regions. Many of these are individual countries. Uh, we look across uh, 15 demand sectors, whether you're talking about the light duty vehicle using the technical term or your car or SUV that you drove here in or a, um, an aspect of uh, rail transportation, various chemical subsectors uh, and industrial subsectors across a wide range of, of aspects of this. And we look across a, a very extensive number of fuel types, actually 20 to take into account all of them. And so we build this up in a very granular detail. Now, we, we don't necessarily need that for the purposes of the presentation today, but we need it for our businesses inside the corporation to plan. Because every one of the individual business company units uses it as the framework for their business planning cycle. So any of you that are in the planning business knows that this is the time of year when everybody's doing these things. And so we're getting hot and heavy right now in building the next year's outlook. And because we're, our planning cycle culminates in the uh, fourth quarter. So when starting to do this, we have to step back and really lay out a, um, our thoughts around what is going to be impacting energy demand as we look out to 2030. Now, as we go through this, I'm going to talk about the demand aspects and how efficiency manifests itself within that. But really, before you even get there, you've got to think about the underlying drivers 
of what's occurring within the world over this time period. One of those is standards of living, and they're in a very dynamic shifting pattern over the next few decades. And that's been true for a long history, and we'll talk about the history of energy transition later. The other thing we have to take into account is economic growth. Clearly, today's world, we're recovering from an economic recession that's very severe, and we've, uh, we've seen a lot of economies start to come out of it, and we see others that are still working to, to struggle through the recovery aspects of it. But long term, energy uh, economic growth is a standard in this world, and it, can, it will continue in the future. The fundamental drivers for that are population, productivity, and economic activity, investments that drive that, and that's going to continue. But when you build this, you also have to take into account, particularly today, as the focus of the debate is around a number of other issues other than just economics and population growth, but around our environment and energy security. So in thinking through the energy profile as we look forward, we really try to envision and take judgment around how these elements would evolve. And one of the things that we felt was really important was first having the right, having a total mix of energy to supply the world, but recognizing that efficiency was going to impact the amount of energy we use and our desire to get the most efficient energy mix is going to affect the mix of energy as well. Now, I'll touch on one more point about these drivers. If you go back and look at the standard of living today, and this represents some World Bank data from 2006, um, shows the amount of people in the world that don't have access to what we'll consider modern energy. Whether you look at electricity on the left or um, modern cooking and heating fuels on the right. And what we mean in the second case is they're using things such as casual wood they find or dung even to heat and cook in their homes. And there's a substantial large portion of the population that don't have access to what we consider modern energy. And now this is going to improve over the next two decades, but it won't be completely eradicated. But one of the things you're going to see uh, as people do, as, we, as the population grows, is people's impact on energy demand is substantial. Today, everybody probably has a pretty good feeling for how much their direct energy use is. And I think of direct as your household or your, transporta your mode of transportation. But the other part of your energy footprint is your industrial impact. You're part of a society that has industry to support your own uh, your own well-being and livelihood, and those of the rest of the world. And so you also participate in a commercial framework where you need access to goods and commercial services that are transported. And you also use buildings like the one we're in right now. And all of these have an energy demand component. And so when you look at it on an individual basis, you really have to appreciate there's a direct and indirect energy component. And as we consider the energy demand output, we have to think in terms of that. So it's substantial. Interestingly enough, it's only about 40% is your direct energy use in North America. 60% is that footprint you don't see every day. And it's interesting when we looked around the world, while the exact ratio doesn't track, similarity is that generally the indirect energy use is greater than the direct energy use. So your impact on the energy system in the world is greater than just what you see every day. So therein lies one of the issues that drives efficiency is the need to make sure the overall system is efficient as possible. The other key driver is understanding the change in population. Here this chart shows three things, population, economic output, and energy demand. Well, population is growing. It has been growing and will continue to grow. We're going to get to about 8 billion people by 2030. That's about a billion and a half more people than are in the world in 2005 using energy. And as we see that, those percentage, those numbers I showed you earlier about people not having access to modern energy are actually going to go down, which means we're going to make progress on standard of living, and we're going to bring a lot more people into an energy environment that's going to use a lot of energy and require that. So how do we get there in the most efficient way? We're also going to see almost a doubling of GDP across the world over this time period. I'll break this down for you a little bit later between the OECD and non-OECD, but the, the non-OECD is, is, is driving the rapid growth in this, while the OECD economies continue to grow, just not at the same pace as the non-OECD, and they'll make up a much more substantial share. Energy demand grows about 35%. We're today, this is in quadrillion BTUs, and energy demand is about 430 quads today, and that's going to grow, um, uh, 470 quads, it's going to grow to about 630 quads by 2030. All that growth is in the non-OECD. The energy deficiency that we're going to talk about is going to be heavily impacting the developed countries. Now the way we're going to go through this, this presentation is we're going to talk about a series of sectors, 
and then energy supplies. And as we go through this, I'm going to talk about the, uh, both the demand in there and where the efficiency systems are starting to manifest themselves. Here, um, this is done in quadrillion BTUs. The four primary sectors, we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we study several, but we consolidate them down for simplification for presentation purposes. Power generation is the largest demand segment today. This includes the power generation fuels that we use and the energy that's, that's uh, that the electricity that we need. And when you grow that out to 2030, 55% of the increase in energy demand that we just talked about shows up in power generation. The other two primary areas are in transportation and industrial. Residential commercial doesn't grow as quickly despite the rapid change in population and that's because of a significant improvement in efficiency. If you look at energy savings overall as we forecast this, and we do this using an intensity forecast, but it's certainly indicative. We think there's about 300 quadrillion BTUs of energy that are going to be not needed in the developing econ in the economy's uh, expansion over this time period uh, above the 160 we will need to make the uh, to fuel the the economy of the future. So I'm going to start with a discussion on residential commercial, and then we'll walk through these, and then we'll wrap. We'll try to pull it all back together again. So in the residential commercial segment, you see residential is by far about three times that of the commercial segment. Your home is the larger source of energy needs that you, that you have individually. But, and as you look out to 2030, the, the bulk of the growth occurs in that area as well. Um, now, how do you forecast energy demand in the residential commercial area? You don't do it directly on population. People do use energy, as I showed you at the beginning, but it's a household that is the energy demand source. We see 900 million more households coming into the equation over this outlook period. Now, what's interesting is when you start to look behind the scene a little bit, you see households growing in developed countries as families prosper and their children grow up and then Buy, acquire a house, but our populations are slowing in their growth rate. So popu household growth in the developed world is, is, is relatively slow. But household growth in the developing world is driven in two parts. One, by the growth in population, but also by the standard of living because the average family size is coming down. And so you have extended families now breaking up in smaller family units that are now taking over households, which has a direct impact on energy. Now here we look energy use per household. And so this is where the efficiency impact is going to be seen. We see almost about 70 million BTUs per household in the developed world, but, at, but you get out to 2030, that drops almost 20%. In the same time period, you only see about a 15% reduction in the non-OECD. And that's directly result of the fact that we're seeing a change in energy mix, but we're seeing a more rapid expansion of household. And also, many of these people don't have electricity. As they do get electricity, they're going to find that they can use it more in different ways. I was in a meeting about six months ago, and somebody made a comment around the room. I guess everybody in the room knows what an app is, right? We all, five years ago, I'm not sure we would have had that word. They said the most amazing app was the light bulb. And then somebody corrected him and said, no, it's actually the outlet because think of all the things you plug into it. And it's true, because one of the things when you study electricity demand, and you start to understand what's happening with electricity demand, you see that while we become more efficient in the developed world in our home heating, our air conditioning, and a lot of the utilities that we use in there, there's still a growing demand segment because of all the new things we can plug in. My phone's over there, but it's got a charger at home. And probably you, now you have an iPod or you might have an iPad or some other device. I'm not necessarily promoting Apple products here, but, um, but everybody's got something else you plug in. Your, the, the flat screen TVs, many of those are, are extremely heavy energy users. So all of that stuff is happening and we're seeing over this time period a focus on those efficiency, whether it's in the manufacturing side, driven by customer desires, or other initiatives as Amy's participated in. Now, what happens in the fuel mix is also part of where the efficiency shows up. I, I, I pulled the chart out and left it in the back, but, but there's, a, there's a chart that shows absolute share of energy supply. Biomass dominates in this area because of the, uh, the non-OECD countries and their use of biomass within their energy space. Biomass almost doesn't change over this time period on a share basis. And you see a rapid expansion of natural gas and other energy types. And those are generally and specifically more efficient forms of energy use than biomass was. So within the residential commercial, in the developing world, you see it occurring as we see the shift from, from lower efficient forms of energy to a higher efficient form of energy. Within the OECD, you see it as we focus on efficiency uh, measures within our own households. Now we'll talk about transportation next. 
Here's an area rich in, in, uh, in efficiency activity. Most of us are probably more aware of our energy efficiency with our vehicle than we are with our household. And, but if you look at, this chart it shows the, the primary subsectors of transportation demand, broken out with light duty vehicles, the car, SUV you drove here, heavy duty vehicles, those things that carry commercial goods, rail, marine, uh, aviation, the things that are all involved in commerce. And so for purposes of this example, I mean, to, to just display this, we break it into commercial and personal. Talking about personal transportation, the point you should note here is that overall personal transportation demand is starting to flatten out and will do so over a time period. It's actually, we think it'll peak in about 2015. And what's happening there is a significant amount of efficiency is occurring in the developed world and across the transportation space, but particularly in the developed world, offsetting growth in the non-OECD. These charts on the right show personal transportation uh, in millions of barrels a day for, in blue and non-OECD in red. And if you look at this, you see we use about 15 million barrels a day of, of transportation fuel in 2005 in the OECD. When you get to 2030, we drop about 4 million barrels a day of that. It offsets almost entirely the growth in the non-OECD over this time period. And I'll go through what vehicle changes are impacting that. Now, Commercial activity is growing. Remember I talked about overall growth in GDP at the beginning. And commercial activity is driving the growth and need for transportation fuels across all the commercial sectors. And now despite, despite efficiency in there, and we'll talk about that in heavy duty trucks in a minute, we still see growth in both the uh, OECD and the non-OECD. When you take all this apart and you look at it just in the developed world, our, the energy demand for transportation fuels is essentially flat and starting to decline in the OECD. The non-OECD doubles over this time period. And so by 2030, they make, the non-OECD countries make up the majority of the transportation fuel demand. Let's talk about cars. Everybody likes to talk about cars, whether what they drive or uh, what kind of efficiency they're, or when they're going to buy the new car and what's happening. And certainly it's been a very dynamic topic in the U.S. over the last 12 to 18 months. The U.S. is the most heavily penetrated light duty vehicle market in the world. We have 80 cars per 100 people. That's not 100 drivers, that's 100 people. So if somebody has a baby at home, that baby has eight tenths of a car. <laughs> and so what happens is the U.S. has a very well penetrated marketplace and it's really not going to change on penetration level what happens is as population grows we see the car the number of cars grow, grow up. Europe is a slightly different story but roughly their population is larger our fleets are about the same by 2030. What's interesting is when you start looking at the non-OECD countries and we'll put China up as an example their penetration today is so is is very low really less than uh, than one car per hundred, and it only grows to about eight or nine cars per hundred by 2030, and about a fleet of 125 million vehicles. Despite that, when you look at the overall world population, this is the fleet on the right, it grows from about 700 million cars in, 20, in 2005 to about 1.2 billion vehicles in 2030. That's a lot of extra vehicles. Think back to the chart I just showed you. Transportation fuel is going to flatten out in this time period. There's a lot of stuff happening in that fleet. First of all, this, this chart is broken down to show you the various types of vehicle engines or uh, drivetrain systems in here. We've got gasoline, we're all pretty familiar with that one. Diesel, we understand those. And then advanced. What is advanced? Advanced is a vehicle that's either a hybrid or a new type of technology that's going to produce 30-35% more efficient than the underlying conventional gasoline vehicle. We see that reaching sales levels of around about 25-30% of new vehicle sales in most major economies by 2030. But because it takes a long time for the fleet to turn over, there's probably only in the 13 to 15 percent range of the total fleet. The underlying gasoline vehicle is still going to be probably, we believe, the largest vehicle component. Okay, well the good news is there's a lot happening here when you look at efficiency. This, this chart shows the breakdown between three areas of engine, transmission, body, and accessories of the types of efficiency opportunities you can see. Most of this is what we would call low-hanging fruit. Things that are available to the manufacturers today but are not as cost competitive and so they've been options. They're going to be pushed into the vehicle fleet in part by policy but also by buyer preference. And you see this in each one of these areas. And odds are some of you have cars today that have some of those features in them but maybe not all of them. And you'll see them come in in more, 
more significant ways. And certainly when you actually get down to the vehicle design itself, lightweighting plastics and other materials that will go into it, tire liners, all sorts of improvements around there and, and accessory efficiency will be a big part. You put it all together, you're talking 35% possible improvement in the underlying vehicle by 2030, above efficiency levels of where you're starting now on the average fleet. <laughs> So you take that into account, you're going to have a big impact on the underlying efficiency with these types of improvements alone. Now then you go beyond that and you start talking about the advanced vehicle. Clearly the diesels are more efficient and they'll penetrate some. But this is an area most people really want to talk about. Uh, we find a lot of dialogue around it. Conventional technology improvement is at the bottom. We just talked about that. Hybrids, similar range, 30, 35 percent. They're, they're very popular, relatively small sales still today, but we're starting to see more ops, more vehicle types available, more choices, and we do expect that sales profile to increase. The plug-in hybrid is certainly getting a lot of discussion within the manufacturers. They're starting to bring some out. We think the penetration is going to be a little lower but then some of the other options, and the electric vehicle as well. In the U.S. and China, we think you'll see 30% of new car sales in 2030 in this new advanced vehicles fleet. Now, when you, the only reason we're talking about all this is what happens with efficiency. Vehicle efficiency here on the right, you can see the, uh, here we've got Europe, India, China, and the U.S. And now this is an on-the-road number. We do miles per gallon. Yeah, uh, the, the number you see in the sticker in the car is a laboratory number. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. And they recently changed the way you calculate the laboratory number, so it's even more confusing. But these are not. This is our, um, our estimates of what the uh, laboratory number is, uh, the non-laboratory, the on-the-road is. Now, I don't want to quote the numbers wrong, because I have done that from time to time. The um, Europe reaches about 48 miles per gallon equivalent in 2030. The India and China should get to about 43, and the U.S. is going to get to 35. Now, on a laboratory number for the U.S. equivalent to 44 miles a gallon, to put it in context with the 35 uh, mile per gallon target that we talk about from the CAFE standards that have been adjusted here in 2009, even from the 2007 numbers. So in our outlook, we hit those numbers, but we continue the efficiency beyond that because we think policy and buyer preference is going to continue to demand a more efficient vehicle. And so you see the world's vehicle fleet getting to be more and more efficient. That goes all the way back to that statement I made at the beginning, which is flat, the vehicle transportation demand is going to flatten out. So what happens when you talk about heavy-duty vehicles? Well, first, this one is different. Ve cars, you, you actually figure out the number of cars and how many miles people are going to drive and, how, and all that, and you, that's how you project that energy demand. This is driven off of a relationship around uh, economic output and commercial movement of commercial goods is directly related to commercial output and so this is the US history. What's important is on the right though is over this 20, 20 year period we think there's potential of 40 percent improvement in the underlying vehicle itself, the heavy duty vehicle. The big truck that's out there on the road can become 40 percent more efficient. That's the good news. The bad news is if you're in an area that's very congested you're going to lose that. You're going to lose a significant amount of that. If you're, oh, if you're in a developing country though you have an upside. And the upside is today's developing country fleet is smaller. It's not the large 40, 50,000 pound truck or ton truck that you see on the road today, the 18 wheelers. It may be a six wheeler and it might be hauling coal even. It could be any number of inefficient steps. And so there's a lot of upside on there. And when you, when you start to look at the absolute energy use per GDP in the non-OECD and the OECD, what you see here on the left, is that the non-OECD gets, gets at least a 40% if not more improvement from 2005 to 2030, while in the developed world it's only about a 10% improvement, and that's because of the congestion. Another small factor affecting uh, heavy-duty transportation is the fact that we shop differently today. We don't all go to the mall or the store and buy things. We actually have things delivered to our house. So now the truck actually has to bring the, the individual good to us, and that's a less efficient way to have product delivered to you. At any rate, when you look at it on a, on a, on a growth basis, you see the total basis, you see overall uh, energy demand growing in the, uh, this is a million barrels a day for heavy duty vehicles. The non-OECD doubles over this time period and represents the largest share of this. I mean, it's a reoccurring theme as we go through this. It's the non-OECD is driving demand, driving demand. We'll see that. And efficiency is controlling demand within the OECD. Let's talk about industrial for a minute. Uh, the industrial demand, this is obviously a sector directly related to the economic output of countries. 
it's not just individual personal choice here. Here we're talking about things that are directly related to the output of uh, economies. We break it in, for this purpose of this presentation, four, sub, four subgroupings. Heavy industry is the largest demand choice uh, segment and continues to do so. It takes two-thirds of the energy demand going forward. Chemical industry is, a, is almost doubling over this time period, but only grows about 25, 30 percent, and it takes a third of the energy growth. It's interesting. The energy industry, now remember, we just talked about products related for transportation. We grew from 44 to 60 million barrels a day. We're seeing a rapid increase, if you will, in that segment to support the non-OECD countries. But the energy industry demand doesn't really change much. There's two things in there. There's a lot of efficiency going into the energy industry activities itself, and there's a reduction of flaring. But 80% of the energy savings there are actual energy improvements. Uh, every company that's involved in any aspect of the energy business is, in, is trying to reduce their energy use because it's frankly, it's more cost effective and we save money. This is the sector that has the largest energy savings overall out of all of our analysis is the industrial sector and it makes sense because energy is a direct cost and a direct reduction off the bottom line. So companies, businesses, countries focus on reducing energy. If you look at the energy use in this sector, the non-OECD actually declined slightly. Part of this is driven by the recession, and you can see the little notch here in the outlook where we, we lost some economic output as a result of the recession. Some of that doesn't come back. We've done, we're down about four quadrillion BTUs in this area, and half of that is in the U.S. The non-OECD grows about 50% uh, over this time period, and 40% of that growth is in China. Now, that's not saying there's not efficiency underway there. China's got one of the largest steel industry in the world, and they've put in place a lot of more modern steel facilities, and they're replacing modern steel facilities. They're, they're going to electric arc furnaces so they can more inexpensively reduce scrap iron and use it again. All of those are efficiency steps. It's just the rapid economic output of those economies is driving an increase in demand. And so you can't really overcome the efficiency. You can't overcome the demand growth with the efficiency. But in the OECD, where we do see economic output growing, still you, um, you see uh, the impact of efficiency. I'd add one point. Historically, people always point to this and say, well, that's because the developed world, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, developed world is shifting all of its, its heavy industry out. We went back and looked at the share of, in, of, um, of heavy of industry, industrial output as part of GDP over the last uh, 25, 30 years. And you saw a very rapid drop in industrial output as a share of GDP up to about 2000. And it, it fell very rapidly. From 2000 forward, you saw that starting to, to, to flatten out. It didn't plateau, but the amount of drop of industrial output fell dramatically. So we, start to, we believe that we're starting to see a period where the developed economies, they do have some, econ some industrial output that can shift, but nothing like the levels that we saw over the deck, the 80s and 90s. This is the energy breakdown. One of the things that's happening here, you'll see coal basically hasn't really grown in absolute quantity. It's fairly flat in this range. Gas is growing, and you'll see um, uh, oil is growing. The, gro the oil growth here is really feedstock growth for chemicals. It's not going in as an as a energy heat source. And you're seeing gas replacing other heat sources, and that's where some of the efficiency is coming in, because gas, often you can get a better combustion out of gas. Uh, we'll talk about electricity next, if I can get the chart, there we go. This is electricity demand. Now this is not power generation fuel, this is electricity demand. Electricity demand is the fast, it's growing faster than overall energy growth. It's growing almost as fast as economic growth. It's growing at about 2.4% over this period from 2005 to 2030. Economic growth is about 2.7%. I'm going to come back in a minute and show you how that relates to uh, uh, earning capacity and standard of living. That you can see it's really growing across all the sectors, but heavy industry is capturing the largest absolute share of the growth. And it's not surprising when you look at the, the amount of energy that's going into economic development in the non-OECD. Here on the right, oops, come back. You'll see where it's growing, and it's growing everywhere. China's energy demand growth, uh, electricity demand growth triples over this time period and becomes the largest individual electricity consuming country in the world. Uh, from a uh, smaller fraction compared to the U.S. or Europe today. Uh, the other thing that's going on is when you look at the relative shares of the electricity production facilities, this is not fuel, this is what kind of plants are coming out of, 
you'll see that gas is growing. Coal seems to be um, uh, dropping in share a bit. Gas is growing in share. But most interestingly, nuclear and renewable ga capture about 40% of the electricity supply in 2030. Now, this is a result of uh, multiple factors. One, the, um, the, we'll talk about a carbon policy issue in a minute, but carbon policy, but also countries like uh, China on energy security. China's got a very active nuclear program, um, and we see a, a rapid expansion of nuclear within China. And, you know, that takes away from other types of energies within that mix, improving the efficiency of the system overall. Now, electricity, what's driving electricity demand? Well, it's economic output, and it's also standards of living. This chart shows GDP per capita across the bottom, and it shows ele uh, electricity per capita vertically. And what it starts to correlate, and this is a group, this is the whole 100 country group with all the little gray dots, but we have only highlighted four groups, the US, Europe, China, and India. And when you look out to 2030, as we see the GDP per capita increase in India and China, you start to see them move up the curve in electricity use. Electrification of the non-OECD is a very common, is, is, is widely agreed, expected, and this is how we forecast it. You can see that the U.S. is starting to plateau, Europe is growing a bit more, but, can, but we're really seeing the primary increase in electricity demand is in the non-OECD, which was what the other chart summarized. I just wanted you to see how it directly relates back to um, uh, GDP per capita. Now, I mentioned carbon policy. One of the things that we think will drive efficiency in the OECD and the fuel choice selection is going to be a carbon policy. We, this shows a, uh, that compares the cost of various generation types, uh, coal, gas, nuclear, wind. We have coal with carbon capture and storage, wind, uh, gas with carbon capture and storage, and solar. Now, this is a theoretical plant that starts up in 2025. We use a range of, of capital assumptions to build these, and this shows no CO2 cost. And for coal and gas, we use some recent historical trend data for, for fuel prices. We're not projecting a fuel price. So when we add $30 a ton, we go from an environment where coal and gas were the most competitive to where we start to see, uh, this is per ton of CO2, we see gas, nuclear, and wind probably slightly more competitive than coal. And this is sort of where we see the carbon price in this range over the next decade. And so what that leads you to is an expectation that gas is going to start getting preferentially dispatched and also gas facilities will be preferentially built. As we move into this period, we think nuclear and wind will start to be built absent any sort of policy mandates because they won't need it. They'll be competitive within this space. Now we tested this out to a higher level of $60 a ton. And here you see gas, coal move up very much, moving um, away from the gas, nuclear, and wind space to where we see gas, nuclear, and wind really pri being the primary preferred source for power generation. Solar really doesn't come into mix, and you've got to get above $60 a ton to where the carbon capture and storage plants actually start to become economic. So what we expect in this time period is carbon capture and storage is going to come in more in a, a test model, some demonstration plants. We need to get the regulatory structure right. I know it gets a lot of attention within the climate debate, and fully understand that, but there's a lot of things that we need to see occurring in here before that's going to become an economic option. So what happen, what's happening in the power generation fuel mix segment as you look around the world? And here's another place where you start to see how efficiency is impacting. In the U.S., about 50, in 2005, we had about 50% of our fuel mix in, in power generation was coal, and that's going to decline to about 30%. In Europe, it's going to drop to about 10%. In Asia, you see it continuing. I don't want to pull my wires out here. Uh, in Asia, we can we see it continuing to uh, uh, to be strong, but still we see it dropping in share to just over about 50 percent from about two thirds. And what you see is gas, the renewables, nuclear growing, and and as you move away from coal to gas, you get a natural improvement in efficiency there. A lot of the existing coal facilities in the U.S., for example you know, may have, uh, some of the older ones may be in the 20% in the efficiency range. Even a more modern one is only in the high 30s. And you move, go to a combined cycle gas turbine facility, you're going to see an efficiency kick up that's dramatic. And so here is where you actually see efficiency occurring within the sort of the wholesale mix, if you will. And this occurs across this, this pool as well. Then if you start looking around the rest of the world, the Middle East, 
Latin America and Africa, here are their energy mixes, and you see gas gaining in share and all. And matter of fact, coal is really not present within the Middle East or Latin America in a noticeable way. There is some, quite a bit in Africa. But you see gas gaining share there, as well as renewables and nuclear across these. So what you're starting to get into is an environment where we're moving to more efficient operations, more efficient power generation. And all of this combines to create this overall efficiency story that we're seeing in the outlook over this time period. Now, one of the other advantages of gas, of course, is the lower, and that we saw that on the earlier chart, is, is the lower uh, emissions footprint of a gas power plant compared to a coal power plant. You know, substantially fewer emissions and more efficient, so you get a, a double, a double uh, impact here. So if you try to step back now at the global level and say what's happening with overall energy demand, this is the breakdown by sector of that chart I showed you at the beginning with the, the population and the um, uh, economic output. And what you can see here is that oil was about, well, we'll come to oil in a minute. If you look, uh, power generation is the, is the most rapid growing segment. Transportation is growing, but because of the improvements in vehicle efficiency, the growth is slowing. Industrial demand is actually fairly stable. There is growth there, but not as much as you would have had without all the efficiency. And residential commercial has very little growth in it. If you look at the energy mix that's making it up, oil is sub still sub the largest share but oil is, is really not, its share is actually decreasing as a share of the overall mix of energies. Gas is growing and coal, coal is shrinking and we see a substantial amount of growth within the wind, solar, biofuels, nuclear, the group at the top. So let me just show you an example of what does this mean for some countries. If you look at the U.S., the U.S. energy demand, and I've got it by sector and by fuel, is going from about 97 to 92 quadrillion BTUs over the outlook period. So it's down, call it four and a half, five percent. What you see though, now the U.S. economy is going to expand at about 70, 71 percent over this time period, growing about 2.2 percent a year. You see a decrease in energy use. Part of that is because of the efficiency steps we're talking about, part of it is a change of the energy mix. And so you see this manifest itself within the OECD. You look at Europe, there we go. Europe. Europe is not, energy demand is not quite as high as the U.S. It's in the 75, 72 range, and it's decreasing about, about three to four uh, quads, going down about a little over four percent. And its energy mix is also changing, and efficiency measures are coming in place. And its economy is expanding by about 50 percent. So again, within the OECD, this is, you, and you can look at each one of the OECD countries, and almost without comparison, they're all showing a similar story. Now, you talk about the Asia-Pacific non-OECD, and you have a very radically different story. Here, you're looking at a, uh, a four-fold increase in GDP over this time period. You're seeing a shift in, uh, in energy use types, growth across all of them, except the smallest growth is in biomass. But so what you're, this is where economic output is occurring so rapidly that efficiency can't really keep up with what's going on. So, so what we're seeing here is a need for multiple energy sources around the globe to, to make this uh, happen. And you can look at the other, you can break the uh, non-OECD down into other individuals and you'll see similar types of stories. And this is really how it manifests itself. So just to look at it, here's the GDP broken down between OECD and non-OECD. You see that by 2030, the non-OECD is about 60% of the output of the OECD. Remember at the beginning I said combined it almost doubles over this time period. Most of the growth, but not all of it, is in the OECD, non-OECD. You see it relative to where it starts. Absolute change from 2009 to 2030 is $18 trillion in each of the groups. And this is what happened to energy demand. Energy demand in the, in the OECD is essentially flat. The non-OECD is where you see all the growth. We've now taken it apart and talked about where it's shown up, so it's not surprising. It's just it's a pretty dramatic way to look at it when you see it this way. So when you come back and look at the intensity, this is the result chart. When you put it all together and say, what is the economic intensity, energy intensity of the economies that you see? Historically, the world has run at about 1.2% improvement. That is not, those, are, those are efficiencies in productivity as well as efficiencies in use and operation. But going forward, that's going to accelerate. And that, so if you were to hold it flat at 2005, you, would, you could have used another 300 quadrillion BTUs, which is what I told you at the beginning. 
but you're not, you're going to actually accelerate efficiency relative to the historical trend. So now, what are the energy types that are going to be growing and needing more? Well, we talked about how oil is growing, it's feeding feedstocks and some transportation growth. Coal, coal is growing, but not as much as it has grown in the past. Gas is growing the most of the fossils. It's, about 50, it's over 50% larger in energy uh, supply in 2030 than it was in 2005. But you see a substantial growth in nuclear, hydro, and about 10% per year growth in wind, solar, and biofuels. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's about a quarter of 1% in 2005, a share of the energy mix. It's going to be about 2.5% in 2030. That's a tenfold increase. This, you can look at the U.S. It's the same story. It's about half of 1% in the U.S. today. It's going to be about 5% um, five, five of the energy mix of the U.S. in 2030. And so you see a lot of growth there. We've already talked about where all the energy demand growth is. When you break the energy savings down, roughly three quarters of it is in the OECD and a quarter of it is in the non-OECD. And so it's consistent with really the, the outlook story is how it's built. I'm going to give you a couple of charts on what's happening with oil and gas and then uh, uh, talk a bit about emissions and then uh, wrap this up and take some questions. This is the energy, uh, the, the oil demand chart that uh, we pulled together. The top line says that we used about 84 million barrels in 2005. We're projecting 104 million barrels of liquid supplies needed in 2030. <coughs> now, where do those come from? Non-OPEC crude and condensate are going to make up a, a fairly stable component of this, but not because it's the same production in 2030 that we have in 2005. A substantial amount of these investment dollars that everybody, the trillions of dollars that people kick around in the energy industry is going to go into that bottom segment as we see supplies coming on and maybe it's Brazil, Kazakhstan, other areas and also the more traditional areas. The Canadian oil sands are going to expand and make up a component of that. Other petroleum, yeah, this is our catch-all, otherwise we'd have to have eight names there. One of those though is NGLs, natural gas liquids that are going to be produced out of all the incremental gas production that we're seeing is making up a substantial share of that. Uh, biofuels, we believe there's about 3 million barrels a day of biofuels in 2030. Um, we don't meet the U.S. Uh, ISA targets for, uh, for biofuels. We don't think the second generation biofuels are really uh, going to be economical within this time period. Technology is going to have to advance and other structures are going to have to change within this window to really make those viable. And you're going to see, you're going to have to call on OPEC crude to balance and that's going to be growing over the time period. When you, if you try to distill it down, what does it mean? In 2005, we needed 84 million barrels a day. We needed 104 in 2030. And it's almost a 50-50 mix of supplies from non-OPEC and OPEC supplies to make that balance possible. Natural gas. Now, here's an interesting story. We always like to talk about our industry as a technology industry. And there's certainly a story in the U.S. about technology and natural gas. And that unconventional wedge that we have up there, we break the gas down into conventional, unconventional pipeline and LNG, the top two being imports. And unconventional, as you know, if we put this chart up from 10 years ago, it wouldn't be there. Or you'd have a little bit of tight gas and a little bit of coal bed methane. Not the fact that over 50% of the gas supply in 2030 is going to be from unconventional. And, you know, it's, it's early days. It's learning days. I mean, every year I see a new resource outlook, and it's bigger. Now, at some point, those are going to go the other way. But the industry continues right now to be pushing those out and saying more. In Europe, the interesting story is, uh, is the import story. It continues to grow. It's about 45% of their gas supply in 2005, but it's 70% or more by 2030. Substantial amount of imports. It's made up majority by pipeline, but not an insignificant amount of LNG. And if you look at the Asia Pacific, you can see that LNG, the top uh, uh, striped area, continues to grow. And that's just because of the distributed nature of the economies out there and the fact that many of the growing economies don't have adequate indigenous resources. Uh, and there is a substantial amount of gas resources in Asia, but they will balance with LNG. So what is, what, what's happening in the emission space? You know, we're talking efficiency. We're talking about a shift, an increase in use of gas. We're talking about an increase in use of electricity. We're talking about a number of things happening in the energy space. And so what's happening is overall emissions are growing. They're growing at less than energy demand growth. And so that's an important thing to take away. They're, they're also declining, we believe, in the OECD over this time period, while they are growing in the non-OECD. And if you look at how 
countries and groups use energy, whether it's per capita or per GDP, you see that certainly the OECD uses more energy per capita. But the, we're starting, the gaps are starting to change. But then if you look at economic output, we produce, the OECD countries produce a significant more out of, of, OE, of economic output for a given amount of energy. And the non-OECD is, start, is, is starting to reduce theirs as well. So we're starting to see some movement in these relative positionings. Certainly, by 2030, the majority of emissions is going to be uh, produced by the non-OECD based on our outlook. Now, to focus a little bit more on the OECD, and this will try to tie back my comments about efficiency, we pretty, we pretty much grew about 2, million, 2 billion tons of CO2 emissions by, from, from 1980 to 2005. And we think we're going to reduce and eliminate those by 2030. And so how did, they do, how did this happen in our economies? Well, two things are happening. One, as you move down the page, this chart is trying to tell you as we come down in, in energy per GDP, we're increasing efficiency, which is the vertical axis. And as we move from right to left, we're, we're using fuels that have less carbon in them. And whether that's gas because it's more, has less carbon than coal, or we're using wind and nuclear and other forms, of, we're decarbonizing the fuel mix. And what that is doing is that is allowing a continued progress on this uh, efficiency uh, decarbonization matrix analysis. And it shows a progress in a direction that we believe will continue as we go forward. And it certainly there was, shows the impact of efficiency on the emissions that we see in the developed world. Now, I, this is one chart we, we developed as part of our outlook this year to help people remember things about energy. The energy system, and this is a chart about the U.S. energy mix. It goes back to 1850. The EIA actually has data back to the 1700s, but it's pretty much all wood. This shows the transition from wood to coal in this 50 years, from 1850 to 1900. Now put yourself in that position back there. We're starting to develop steam engines. We're starting to use steam as a major force of, of, uh, of mechanical energy. And clearly, coal is a superior energy source, right? It's easier to transport. It's more dense. It carries more energy. And it doesn't rot. You can actually store it. So, it, and so logically, it's the right choice. It took four decades for coal to replace wood as the majority energy supply in that 50-year period. So now what you look at is the technologies are highlighted in these circles and shows you what's going on in the technology space around our development in those 50 years. So two things are happening. Technology drives the use of energy, but technology allows us to access energy. You remember it was, it was 1859 when, we did, when the, uh, the first oil well, right, was drilled. Now, we weren't trying to develop oil for the uses we think of today. We're trying to replace whale oil so we could light homes. Now, as you go the next 50 years, a lot of things are happening. Personal vehicles are entering the mix, so we need, again, a more dense source of energy, and that's where oil comes into play because it is. I mean, somebody told me the other day, when you, when you put oil in your tank, you're putting um, megawatts in your tank, and when you charge a battery, you're putting kilowatts in your tank. I mean, so it's a much denser form of energy. Maybe an overplayed example, but that's the concept. But we're also learning to do things differently with our energy, how we're finding it and how we're producing it. By 1947, you know, we started drilling uh, for uh, exploring for wells out in the Gulf of Mexico. I know that's a very sensitive topic today, but uh, still, that was a major development in the industry. In 1907, we had the first drive-through gasoline station. As you go out to 2000, passenger flights start to require more liquid fuel. Road freight, different heavy electrification throughout the 1900s in the U.S. And so, and natural gas in homes. And that starts to change the energy mix. You can see the nuclear starting to come in there up by that passenger flight box. And so as you take this out through our outlook period where we see new types of vehicles coming in, new places that we're developing energy, new kinds of energy, and more uses for it, you see the energy mix in the U.S. change. This is happening globally, but it doesn't happen overnight. It takes decades and generations for it to change. The things we start today will be, will be continuing to evolve as we go forward. We use this to try to reinforce with people. Now, this, this audience actually knows this, and I didn't need to show this, but I like this chart. And, and it's a positive note to remind ourselves that it's a very dynamic business we participate in that, that is evolving in this fashion. So where are we? When you look from 2005 to 2030, we're in a very dynamic period. Rapid growing uh, population, massive changes in population and standards of living. We see a huge amount of economic output and needs for energy, but not just any single kind of energy, 
all kinds of energy. It's important to remember, as this outlook was developed, we believe that we need all types of affordable, reliable energy sources. But we also have to be sensitive of how we use those. So we have to really focus on efficiency. We have to make sure we get the supplies we need, whatever they form in, whether it's wind, nuclear, we need to make sure that we have the environment, the investment environment to support that. But we have to be sensitive to the emissions that we produce with the use of energy. And so we believe that technology plays an important part of this story and continues to drive this. There's a lot of technology work that goes into those, those bubbles that I showed in that energy transmission, trans, transition slide. And there's a lot of technology work that's underway today. Those are my prepared remarks. So with that, I'll be happy to answer some questions.